I have uh, um, prepared the final sermon for the sermon series, uh, and then the events of yesterday uh, have challenged me and invited me to call an audible, and literally this morning, uh, I have rewritten the sermon uh, to share with you. And not only that, uh, I have literally edited between the 9 o'clock service and this service, so it is literally coming to you hot off the presses. Uh, and uh, I will tell you, um, my family has this term that, that uh, you know, uh, they will say this sometimes that you can be so overly dramatic. So, this may be one of those moments where you come back to me and say, Your family is absolutely right. You're, you're the drama queen in the family or the jo- drama king in the family. Uh, I don't know if that's the case or not, but I want to give you a, a little bit of context to what has led me to say this morning, early this morning, I need to give a different message uh, than I had planned. Uh, some things that have been kind of kind of converging for me. Uh, my family was going to, we were going to take a trip to Atlanta, and so prior to going to Atlanta, I gave uh, my kids a homework assignment. Don't you love that? Before you go on a vacation, you have a homework assignment. I had watched a, a documentary series on Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, and, and I knew that we were going to go and visit some of those sites, and, and I wanted them to watch that documentary series. And so I had some of that in my background. And some of you uh, may have uh, noticed or, and may already know this story uh, that uh, um, I think it's TBS uh, it, on Tuesday nights has been running a docu-series on Hillsong the Church. Uh, and those that, that don't know, uh, many of us may know Hillsong from a lot of its praise music that's come out, but I happened to be watching that docu-series uh, about Hillsong, and uh, it was heartbreaking. Uh, it's the story of, of a church, a mega, mega church that um, you just, just made a whole lot of, a lot of mistakes. And so I was watching that, and, that, and so that, had kind of, that was part of the convergence. Uh, and then obviously the events of yesterday... Uh, have caused me to say, uh, I need to speak to that. Uh, that's part of being a leader. It's part of being a pastor. And so that's, those are all the things that have kind of converged in on this. So you kind of at least know, uh, okay, that explains this weirdness uh, of our pastor this morning. Uh, so that if you, you know, uh, if it turns out that I am overly dramatic and you're like, oh, uh, that's more than I can handle. There are leadership. There's leaders in the church you can reach out to and And uh, you can call the district superintendent and say, I think it's time we put him out to pasture kind of thing. So uh, that's okay. Uh, But I want you to have some context. Uh, The majority of of you here in person and and probably those who are watching online have certainly, I know all of us, I mean, quickly, if I ask you, where were you at on 9-11? Right? So we all have some some picture of a a national trauma, but, but even more, I'm just curious, just a show of hands, how many of you, and I, I think a good majority of you, uh, if not, well, were alive when, when JFK was assassinated. Yeah. Okay? So, uh, Malcolm X, right? Martin Luther King Jr., Robert Kennedy, George Wallace, Ronald Reagan, and then yesterday with Donald Trump being shot, right? I, I mean, obviously, if you raised your hand at the very beginning, your hand was going to be up the, the entire time. But do you understand the, just that, that list of names, right? So what I want to say this morning will not change this fact. And so I want, I want to invite you to hear uh, what I'm going to say this morning uh, and, uh, and just know that it, it, and for you guys, in some ways, it's been filtered because I've already preached this at the 9 o'clock service and I've come back. But in many ways, it's still very unfiltered. But I want to say one thing. Uh, that won't change this, is that hurting people will hurt people. This is not a sermon about politics. This is not a sermon about gun control or any of those things. I'm just starting with some basic realities. At least I think they're basic realities. I mean, do you agree that hurting people will hurt people, right? That we are in a place of a lot of hurt in the world. True or true, <laughs> right? We live in a sinful broken, violent world. True? Yeah. There are times, I'll ask this, there are times, does it feel like there is more violence than there is good in the world? Yeah. 
And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge that, or I'm gonna, not today, but I want you to be thinking, is that really true, though? Our perception may tell us that that's true. I, I invited you last week, if, you, if you're following the, the e-newsletter, to, to make a list of things that you're looking forward to, right? Uh, and if you made that list of all the things that you're looking forward to, you can't look at that list and not feel hopeful. Just try it. If you sat down every day and said, listen, before I get anywhere into the day, I'm going to make two things. I'm just going to say two things that I'm grateful for. You cannot go through the rest of the day being not having gratitude just because you've got those things. But if we're, if we're wired to look for negative things, we'll always see that. So our perceptions are in that way. I want to invite you. I just want to stop for a moment and invite you to pray with me as we get going. Father, there's things to be said that only you can say. And, and I, I don't think I'm the, the total vessel, but you've invited this impartial, this uh, incomplete, let me say it that way, vessel to stand before this congregation, those who are here in person and those who will listen later, to offer incomplete words but we trust that you will complete them. You will make them whole for us. We ask for your Holy Spirit to, to continue to move freely throughout this service, to do what it is that you need to do for us to be people who no longer conform to the patterns of this world, but willfully and lovingly and joyfully and without hesitation Say, Lord, here I am. Send me. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to obviously spend some time making a statement regarding yet another senseless shooting, uh, this time involving the shooting of former President Donald Trump. But in that, realizing, just pausing for a moment to realize that one person was killed Two people are in critical condition, and a 20-year-old has lost his life. And, and for us just to think, I mean, what that, what that means. And, and a nation has watched that. In case, I'm, I'm going to assume everybody here knows what I'm talking about. I mean, so if, I would say hallelujah if there was one person that said, I have no idea what you're walk, talking about, because that would tell me you were not watching TV yesterday, right? Thank God, for, you know, but, but that's for all of us. And I don't know how it was for you, but at the moment you turned it on and you began to watch, did it not feel like there was an endless loop of the same shot going over and over and over? My point is we are all in a spirit of trauma at this point. And think about how how it's affecting us and how much deeper and more painful it is for the family that has lost a loved one, for, the, for those that are in critical condition, for the family that's lost a 20-year-old, trying to figure out what in the world was going on. Now, it, of course, makes sense that when you gather in a church, right, that I would say the world needs Jesus, right? You wouldn't, I would think you would expect me to say that, right? And I don't, I'm, not, I'm not wavering from that. I don't disagree with that. Uh, I, I think that reality existed, you know, on Friday. <laughs> you know, it, it, it wasn't just the events of yesterday that lead me to say that the world needs Jesus. But today I want to say that what the world needs is for Christians, and I'm specifically going to be talking about Christians in the United States, what the world needs is for Christians in the United States to become desperate for God. The world needs Christians in the United States to actually put into action the teachings of Jesus. Not just talk about what a great teacher Jesus was or what a great example Jesus was, but to actually live that life. Uh, when, I, um, when I was in the, in the, in the, uh, the military, uh, I, I, <laughs> I was having lunch with a captain, 
Uh, and a captain is kind of a big, a big wig, and I was not a big wig. I was just a lieutenant commander. And uh, he said to me, dude, well, captains don't really say dude. But, but what he said to me was, you're really hard on senior officers. What he's saying is, you have high expectations of how officers, senior officers, are supposed to live. And I do, I did. I, I do, and I, I, I did, and I do. I'm going to tell you, I have even higher expectations for Christians. That Christians have, have an incredible responsibility. That we're the hands and the feet. And, and so, yeah, I have these high expectations, and you're going to hear that this morning. I believe the world needs Christians in the United States to admit that our lives have become unmanageable. I'm not talking about the world. I'm just talking about us. We who call ourselves Christians need to say, my life has become unmanageable. We are too proud of all of our accomplishments that we believe we can manage our way out of every single crisis that we come across. Right? Or I mean, I, I'm not asking you to agree with me. I'm just, you know, I, I might say that. I, I, I know some of you are like, I don't think that's true. That's where I'm at. I just think that, that we, we just we figure, we think, give us some time. We put a person on the moon. We've got people going to Mars someday. Just give us some time. We have said things like this. The reason we're in the mess we're in is we've had a failure of imagination. Have you ever heard that? That was what we said at 9-11. We, didn't, we couldn't imagine, right? And so we come to this place and we say our imagination is if, if, only we could, if we would only increase our imagination. I'm going to tell you our imagination will always be failed if the foundation of our imagination is our pride in believing we don't need anyone. And if we say, I don't need God, just give me some time. Let me, let me Google it. Let me just do an internet, you know, internet search, and I will, I will figure all this out. We need to admit that the source of our imagination is God. The world needs Christians in the United States to believe that Jesus' way and teachings are greater than our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. I swore an oath to, to uphold and defend the Constitution. I believe in the, in the Constitution. But I also believe uh, that Jesus' ways and teachings are superior to our Declaration of Independence and Constitution. Blood has been spilt, right, for the purpose of defending our Constitution. Let me ask you this question. When is the last time blood was spilt for the privilege of washing someone's feet? When was the last time blood was spilt for the privilege of telling someone that ruined your reputation or is ruining your reputation, that has embarrassed you in public? When is the last time blood has been spilt so that you could say, I forgive you? The world needs to see Christians in the United States who believe they have no way of being less angry, less violent, less impatient, more generous, practicing more self-control, being less mean-spirited, being less selfish, having more hope without going to church, without going to a church that expects its membership to be supporting, to be encouraging, and to be accountable to one another. In other words, the world needs to see American churches that are more interested in mental and spiritual transformation than likes on Facebook or dollars in checking accounts. The world needs Christians in the United States who believe, who, uh, uh, the world needs Christians in the United States to intentionally create spaces and places where hurting people can feel loved and accepted. I was talking to Kate yesterday, Glenn. I don't know if she shared this story with you, but uh, Kate was wearing a, a T-shirt. I don't, I, I don't know the T-shirt well enough, but it says, uh, I'm a mom who gives hugs or something like free mom hugs, right? So it's a, it's a, um, uh, a gay pride T-shirt. It says free mom hugs. And so she'd gone into the bank uh, to get some quarters to do, uh, to do some laundry. And uh, she, she's a, she was up at camp. And uh, the teller on the other side of the, of the window 
uh, was commenting on her T-shirt and, and made the comment, you know, that she'd like to, have a free, uh, like to have one of those hugs. And Kate was like, well, I'd love to give you the hug, except there's this, you know, there's a barrier between us, right? There's this bulletproof glass and all that. And so the teller says, hold on for a minute. And she comes out, or the teller comes out and comes around and gives Kate a hug. And in that embrace, whispers to Kate, I, I so wanted this hug because I couldn't get it from my coworkers, and I can't get it from my parents. The world needs churches to be places where they can feel that they're welcomed and it's safe. We, we want to stop the violence and the hate that's coming through our airways and watching on our television. We Christians need to stop treating Christianity as a personal preference. We need to actually embrace fully the teachings and examples of Jesus Christ. And we need to be willing to confront those, those Christians who say, when I say confront, I mean confront in love, right? Those who say they're Christians, but they're picking and choosing when they want to be Christians and what teachings they want to follow and not follow. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't know about you, but there are some teachings that there are times that I would like to not follow. You know, when, when someone gets rude with me, I'd like to have permission to get rude back. I don't like that teaching that says, you know, go the extra mile. It's hot outside. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we Christians have to be willing to come along, alongside folks who are doing or picking and choosing. I don't know about you, but I am the best Christian from 11.59 a.m. till 12 noon <laughs> on Sundays. So I haven't even gotten there yet, right? And some of us were like, I am the best Christian on Sunday, but by Sunday afternoon, I have moved on, right? That's what I'm talking about, right? So if we want to stop the violence and the, the, the hate that's coming through our airways, we have to stop picking and choosing and stop tolerating Christians who are doing those kinds of things. The world needs Christians in the United States who are not afraid to have their reputation tarnished for choosing to act like Jesus. Now, I'm not saying we've got to run around and have everybody call us Jesus freaks. That's not something I'm really excited about. But here's something for us to think about. I, I had to, you know, since I've called this audible, I'm kind of... Uh, not there's a sermon that I wrote for today that's sitting on the on the shelf, but I still want to conclude Ruth four, and it actually some of that actually fits with what I'm about to say. In chapter four, we come to this conclusion where Ruth and Boaz get married, but before Ruth and Boaz can get married, there is another guardian redeemer who has to approve. And if you'll we remember this thing that that, that that Boaz has this conversation with the guardian redeemer. And he says, hey, you have the right to say yes. So he says, well, tell me about the land. And so he tells them about the land that's for sale. And the guy says, hey, that's a good deal. I think I'll do that. I think I'll buy that. And Boaz says, God, hold on. Let me, I want to make sure you know all that's involved in this purchase. Do you ever get nervous when someone says, wait, before you buy, there's one more thing. He says, for you, for you to do this, you have to be willing to, to marry Ruth the Moabite. Now remember what we know about the Moabites. The Moabites were the ancestors, right? They, they, were, they came, they were formed out of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his two daughters, right? One daughter, they, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. They looked upon the, the, the planet and said, oh, dad, you're it. There's no other man on the planet. It's up to us, us three and no more, so let's make it happen. And out of that comes the Moabites and the Ammonites, that's not necessarily a great, you ever have some of those family history stories that you're like, mm, I don't know if I'm going to you know, sit around at Christmas time and tell the kids about how they came into the world, right? Not only that, the Moabites were worshiping the god Chemosh who was requiring children's sacrifices. My whole point is, is that Boaz comes back and says, listen, if you take the land, you've got to marry Ruth. And the guy's like, oh, that's a lot of baggage. That's a lot of history. That's a, that's, that might ruin my reputation. What will the town people say about me taking off with a, a Moabite? So even though Ruth is loyal and faithful to Naomi, she is still a Moabite. 
She carries with her the reputation and the history of her people. But, and this guardian redeemer is saying, I don't want the baggage that comes with that land deal. Boaz, however, comes to take Ruth as his wife, despite her history, despite her baggage, despite what it might do to his reputation. Remember, this is all in that context that we Christians have to be willing to let our, our reputation be sacrificed. Boaz chooses to risk his reputation in order to bring honor and inclusion to Ruth. And I want you to notice the reaction that the people of the gate have. It says the, in that verse, it says, The elders and all the people at the gate, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah. They're saying, may the Lord make Ruth May her name be as well known in the history of Israel as Rachel and Leah. What do we know about Rachel and Leah? It says they, were, they brought the family of Israel together. They gave birth to the 12 tribes. And we want this Moabite woman to have that same reputation. May you have standing in Ephrath and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young one, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. What is, what is they saying? Hey, we hope that one day one of the children that, they, that, that uh, Ruth brings into the world will one day be the leader of our country. We have one guardian redeemer says, uh uh-uh, my reputation may be ruined. Another one says, I'm willing to have my reputation ruined, and the entire crowd gathered says, may she be blessed. The world needs Christians in the United States who actually believe Jesus when he said, all of you who have, have horrible, terrible, dirty, rotten pasts are welcome at my table. The world needs churches that are filled with Boazes in this crowd. A church where people who are embarrassed and ashamed of their past can feel welcomed and loved. That's what the world needs from American churches. The world needs Christians in America to stop perpetuating the us versus them rhetoric. To stop placing their political preferences above God's preferences. The world needs Christians in the United States to be willing to sacrifice their reputation by saying, in Christ there is no longer male or female. There's no longer black or white, Republican or Democrat, straight or gay, rich or poor, abled or disabled, Jew or Gentile, all are one in Christ. And then we have to be willing to say, when you shoot one of us, you shoot all of us. When you say something mean-spirited and angry at one of us, you say it at all of us. When you discriminate against one of us, you discriminate against all of us. Are you understand what I'm saying? Maybe. Like I said, Jesus is the guardian redeemer for all of humanity, despite our past. And I believe the world is looking. As I close, I want to make a reference to Bishop Berlin's letter. He sent out a letter, I believe, yesterday afternoon or early this morning. He shared some thoughts about uh, attempting uh, this attempt on former President Trump's life. He referenced the act as a deplorable act. As I watched, uh, I was sickened by the news, and I agree with that description. Can I share with you that when we Christians in America choose not to live according to Jesus' examples, and teachings, when we pick and choose, it's equally deplorable. It causes Jesus to look upon the United States and weep, just as he cried out in pain and agony from the cross when we Christians in the United States act as if we can pick and choose when to be Christian and when not, when we can act like we can pick and choose which teaching, which example of Jesus we want to follow, we're committing deplorable acts. I still believe when I became a Christian, I still believe today, God intends for the United States uh, to be a beacon of hope for the world. With every year, though, that I get older, I become more frustrated with the United States Christian Church. I honestly believe we're experiencing all that we have experienced and will experience because we are picking and choosing what teachings and what examples of Jesus we want to follow. Here's what's amazing. And I'll say at the same time, frustrating. 
Jesus says, even though you're not choosing me, I choose you. Can I tell you, there are times when, with Jesus, I would say, fine. Um, I, or times that I wish Jesus would say, fine. You don't want to follow my teachings. You don't want to choose me. I don't choose you. There are times I wish Jesus would say that. You know when those times are? When I'm feeling high and mighty on my own horse. You ever been there? When you feel like you've got it all together and you're looking around at other people and you're like, yeah, this would be a good time for Jesus to pick and choose. Um, and then there are times when I fall off my horse and I get too big for my britches. I don't know if any of you have ever been too big for your britches and I'm quick to sing Amazing Grace. I wonder if we have that problem, right? Jesus says, listen, even though you did not choose me, I still willfully and lovingly choose to pay that price. Jesus tells us, I forgive your past. I offer you a, a new future, a fresh start, a, a, a new beginning. That's the work of Christians in the United States. We are called to be ministries, ministers of reconciliation where there's hate to bring love, where there's disagreements to figure out how do we sit down and have these conversations. The world needs Christians in America to stop being frustrated with trying to choose between the world and God and instead choose the peace that comes with saying, I will choose to love as Jesus loves. I will choose to serve as Jesus serves. I will choose to love who Jesus loves. I will choose to serve those who Jesus serves. The bishop quoted Bill, Willis Tate, the, the president of Southern Methodist University, who spoke at a convocation following uh, President uh, JFK's assassination. He wrote this about the church. Wherever there is a sin and injustice, the church must call us to repentance. Wherever there is hatred, fear, and suspicion, the church must call us to repentance and reconciliation. Wherever there is lethargy and disloyalty through inaction to our noble faith, the church must call us to repentance and action. My question for us this morning, what's been on my heart, and here's where we've, we're transitioning. I'm, we'll have the choir do its anthem and then at the conclusion of uh, the anthem, uh, I'll offer the benediction. And uh, I'll encourage you, either stay in your seats in prayer, come to the altar, be in prayer. Some of you may have been led this morning and feel like uh, you need to offer a prayer. I invite you to do it in that, in that time, in that space. But that's, that will be at the conclusion of the service, but I, the main point I want you to be thinking about, I'm hoping you've thought about through this, what is it that I need? What is it I need to confess? What part have I been playing in this perpetuation of anger and violence? Let me invite you to be in prayer with me. Father, it feels like a heavy invitation this morning, this call to repentance, this call to, to say, I once was doing life this way, and now I want to do life a different way. There's a wrestling that's going on inside and wondering, well, was I doing it wrong or how am I responsible? And so I just ask, Lord, that your spirit would move amongst each of us. Perhaps it would show us a time when we missed an opportunity to say a kind word to someone. Maybe there's a time we hung up the phone in anger and we went and told someone else about what that person did to us that made us so angry. Maybe we were so caught up in completing whatever 
list we had to do that we, we failed to see someone in need, someone hurting. Lord, these events, these national events, they, they hit us, and they cause us to stop for a moment. But you're reminding us this morning that to have global impact, we need to think more locally. We need to think more personally. And so, yes, Lord, we pray for those who were injured. We especially pray for the family that is mourning the loss of a loved one. We pray for those who are fighting for their lives, and we pray that, that healing will come, that recovery will be soon. We pray for that family that has lost their son, and all that that means, and all that will surround that family, that, that history, that shame, that guilt, that embarrassment. We pray, Lord, that they will experience a church that will welcome them, that will love them, that will tell them about a God who is their guardian redeemer, about a God who is willing to, to sacrifice so that he may tell the good news, you are loved. We pray for the safety of the former president. We pray for the safety of our current president and their families. We pray for those who serve us in, in these elected offices. And we ask, Lord, that you'd help us to monitor our own thoughts and our own words, because oftentimes things don't happen the way that we want them to happen. And oftentimes we get caught up in the things that we say. We thank you for for those first responders, for the Secret Service, and for police officers and emergency responders. We ask, Lord, that you forgive us for the times in which we have taken their sacrifice, their work, for granted. We ask, Lord, that today would be a day that, as we've said numerous times before, let there be peace and let it begin with me, that today would be a day that we hear those words and we own those words. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.